Now, the chair recognizes himself for an opening statement. July 13th was a terrible day for America. We all agree spirited debate, fighting for what you believe in, are part of what makes this country the greatest nation in the world. But the First Amendment and robust political debate are not consistent in any way with violence. What happened in Butler, Pennsylvania was a tragedy that took the life of a good man, Corey Comfortor, leaving a wife without a husband and two daughters without a father. Others were injured, and of course, former President Trump, by the <coughs> grace of God, survived the assassination <coughs> attempt. There are a lot of unanswered questions about the security failures that day, questions about decisions made before the rally, questions about actions during the rally, and questions about statements made after the event concluded. Prior to the rally, why was the president's security detail denied requests for extra resources? Why weren't all the buildings secured? For a finite number of buildings that needed to be secured, why wasn't that done? Why was the president allowed to walk out on the stage when there was a suspicious person on the property? During the rally, what exactly happened between 609 and 614, those critical five? We know from briefings from the director and the deputy director of the FBI and other information we've gathered that at 609, the shooter was identified on the roof. At 610, the counter sniper, was, counter -sniper teams were notified about the shooter. 611, the shooter fired several shots, injuring and killing one person, injuring others. At 612, the counter and at 614, President Trump was escorted off the stage by Secret Service agents. We need to know what happened play by play, moment by moment, second by second, the communications that took place, again, during that critical five minutes. And then finally, after the rally, why did both the Secret Service and Secretary of Homeland Security, Mayor, lie to the American people? July 14th, the day after the attack, Secret Service spokesman Anthony said this, quote, the assertion that a member of the former president's security team requested additional security resources that the U.S. Secret Service or the Department of Homeland Security rebuffed is absolutely false. The next day, Secretary Mayorkas said, that is an unequivocal false assertion. We had not received any requests for additional security measures. But five days later, top officials repeatedly rejected requests from Donald Trump's security detail for more personnel. And on the, the New York Times confirming what the Washington Post reported said, quote, Mr. Guglielmi acknowledged that the Secret Service had turned down requests for additional federal security assets for Mr. Trump's detail. 180 degree change. Why did they initially lie to us in the days after the attack in Pennsylvania? Finally, we hope to learn more today from Director Ray about the shooter, his use of the drone, the explosives that were in his car, and a host of other questions. It is our hope that Director Ray's testimony can begin to give answers to the American people about all of these questions and concerns. So, Director, we appreciate you being here. And we trust that you're going to be as transparent with the committee and the country as you possibly can. And I'm sure you understand that portion of the country has a healthy skepticism regarding the FBI's ability to conduct a fair, honest, open, and transparent investigation. And that skepticism is based on what they've witnessed over the past several years. The American people have seen a Biden-Harris Justice Department that can't tell us who planted the pipe bombs on January 6, that can't tell us who leaked the Dobbs opinion, and that can't tell us who put cocaine at the White House. Biden-Harris Justice Department who raided President Trump's home. Biden Justice Department who worked with social media companies to censor Americans. Biden-Harris Justice Department who let the country believe that the Hunter Biden laptop was misinformation when they knew at the time it was authentic. And maybe most importantly, a Biden-Harris Justice Department who retaliated against whistleblowers who came to this committee and spoke to us about these issues. Last week, we sent you 12 questions about July 13th. We expect you to answer those questions and the others that I've just outlined. And again, we thank you for being here today and appreciate your willingness to answer the questions that the committee is going to have. And with that, I would yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, two weeks ago, our country witnessed a shocking assassination attempt on a presidential candidate. Now, I disagree with Donald Trump in almost every policy area imaginable. I am frequently shocked and outraged at the plans he has for our country and the words that come out of his mouth. And I have dedicated much of the last eight years to fighting his agenda. 
But regardless of my strong feelings about Donald Trump's behavior, I unequivocally and unabashedly condemn with every fiber of my being the attempt against his life. This was not just an attack on a man, but an attack on our democracy. Political violence erodes the very foundations of our nation. The concepts of freedom of speech, of peaceful transitions of power, of a democratic government at its core, these cannot exist if political violence is allowed to fester and to go unchecked. And if you think that this one assassin's bullet was a bolt out of the blue, and not part of a wave of violence that has threatened this nation for years, then you have missed the point of what my Democratic colleagues and I have been imploring you to hear for some time. Election work, many of them working for free, face near constant threats of violence. In one recent instance, an Indiana man pleaded guilty to threatening to kill an election worker who said that there were no irregularities in a recent election. That man said, quote, 10 million plus patriots will surround you when you least expect it and will expletive kill you, close quote. That is political violence. In another instance, Speaker married to Nancy Pelosi's husband who was bludgeoned over the head with a hammer by an intruder in his home who had been there to capture Ms. Pelosi, interrogate her, and possibly, quote, break her kneecaps because of her liberal views. That is political violence. The death threat surging against Vice President Harris, former President Obama and his wife Michelle, and Governor DeSantis, as well as many others, including videos online of individuals holding guns making assassination threats. That is political violence. The plot to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer and overthrow parts of the state government. That is political violence. The brutal, deadly attack three years ago against this very building, with rioters breaking through peace barriers, run through these halls chanting, kill Nancy, and hang Mike Pence, and even hanging a noose outside the building. These rioters battering Capitol Police officers and forcing members of Congress and their staffs to go into hiding, squatters under desks or in closets. That is political violence. This assassination attempt, as horrific as it is, should surprise no one. And you would think a political party that almost lost their presidential candidate through an act of political violence would have something to say about the way their leaders keep talking about the next election. Donald Trump has warned there will be a, quote, bloodbath if he loses. Republican Ohio State Senator George Lang said just last week at a rally for J.D. Vance that he is, quote, afraid that civil war might be necessary if Republicans lose the November election. President of the right-wing think tank and Project 2025 leader, the Heritage Foundation, Kevin Roberts, said on Stephen po Bannon's podcast, quote, we are in the process of the second American Revolution which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be, close quote. Republican former Aladdin Palin said in August of last year of Trump's indictments, do you want a civil war? Because that's what's going to happen. We're not gonna keep putting up with this. We do need to rise up and take our country back, close quote. I could go on, but it's more and more of the same. And I hear nothing from the other side of the aisle in this room about these statements. Do you support a bloodbath if you don't get the election outcome you want? Do you justify violence if the left does not agree with you? And what exactly has preoccupied this Republican majority while their allies threaten violence to their political enemies, real and imagined? We have chased down baseless conspiracy theories designed solely to influence the 2024 election in favor of Donald Trump. We have spent millions of dollars and thousands of hours of staff time in more than 100 transcribed interviews chasing false accusations against President Biden supporting an impeachment effort that seemed designed to fail and hunting for a smoking gun that simply does not exist. And instead of admitting that these investigations found no corruption, coercion, or unethical behavior by the Biden administration, the Republicans chose to just dig deeper and spend more money. Imagine what could have happened if we had spent these of hours of staff time and those millions of taxpayer dollars addressing even one aspect of the political violence that now threatens our country. Perhaps had this Republican majority lifted a finger to help a nation that is awash in guns, the assassin and Butler would not have had such easy access to the weapon he used to fire on that crowd. Director Ray, your agency is responsible for addressing some of the most serious issues of our time. The Bureau of Fights Gun Violence, which claims the lives of 40,000 Americans every year. It protects election security from growing threats 
from malign foreign actors who are working tirelessly to influence our elections. It protects against domestic terrorists and violent extremists who have been a growing threat in recent years and have carried out horrific mass shootings and deadly events around the country. And so, so much more. I apologize to you, Director, that instead of supporting you in these missions in the 118th Congress, some of my colleagues have instead hindered your work, maligned your agents, and called to abolish and, de and defund your agency, all for political gain. It is despicable, especially from the party that claims to, quote, back. And I know that you and your many agents and employees have paid the price for these baseless attacks. I know you have faced a barrage of threats, distrust, and vitriol from the public as a result of these wild, politically driven conspiracies. I know it has been more dangerous and difficult for you to come to work each day. I may not agree with you on everything, but I sincerely thank you and every employee in your agency who continues to protect our country. The FBI is vital to keeping America safe, and I pray that today we can focus on the real, substantive work of the agency. It is the least we owe our country in these times. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's witness. Um, the Honorable Christopher Ray has been the director of the FBI since 2017. He previously served as the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice, the Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General, an Associate Deputy Attorney General, and as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. Again, Director Ray, you've been here many times. We appreciate you being here today. And, uh, look forward to your testimony and answering our questions. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your let the record affirm, uh, let, let the record reflect that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Uh, thank you, and please be seated. We, we have votes coming in about 10 minutes, but we, we definitely want to get through your opening statement as far as we can, and this is going to be an interesting day on Capitol Hill with uh, the Prime Minister of Israel here as well. So, Director Ray, you're recognized for your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee. Uh, I want to begin on the passing of Representative Jackson Lee, who serve the people of Texas in this body and on this committee for so long. Thank you all for your support of our efforts to protect the American people. I am proud to be here today representing the 38,000 special intelligence analysts and professional staff who make up the FBI, men and women who every day work relentlessly to counter the most complex threat environment I've seen in my tenure as FBI director, and maybe in my entire career in law enforcement. Before I go any further, I also want to acknowledge and offer my deepest kisses to the victims of the assassination attempt in Butler County. To the friends and family of Corey Comparator, who by all lost his life protecting others from danger, to the others, two of whom were critically wounded, and of course, of course, to President Trump, former President Trump and his family. As I've said from the beginning, the attempted assassination of the former president was an attack on our democracy process, and we will not and do not tolerate political violence of any kind, especially a despicable account of this magnitude. And I want to assure you and the American people that the men and women of the FBI will continue to work tirelessly to get to the bottom of what happened. We are bringing all the resources of the FBI to bear, both criminal and national. Now there's a, a whole lot of work underway and still a lot of work to do, and our understanding of what happened and why will continue to evolve, but we're gonna leave no stone unturned. The shooter may be deceased, but the FBI's investigation is very much ongoing. To that point, I also want to acknowledge that I recognize both the congressional and in this case, and the importance of this investigation to the American people. And I understand there are a lot of open questions. So while the investigation is very much ongoing and our assessments of the shooter and his actions continue to evolve, my hope here today is to do my best to provide you with all the information I can, given where we are at this point. 
I have been saying for some time now that we are living in a threat environment. And the Butler County assassination attempt is another example, a particularly heinous and very public one, of what I've been talking about. But it also reinforces our need at the FBI and our ongoing commitment to stay focused on the threats, on the mission, and on the people we do the work with and the people we do the work for. Every day, all across this country and indeed around the world, the men and women of the FBI are doing just that, around the clock, to counter the threats we face. Just in the last year, for example, in California, the FBI and our partners targeted an organized crime syndicate responsible for trafficking fentanyl, meth, and cocaine all across North America. We charged the Mexican-based suppliers who brought the drugs into the United States, a network of Canada-based truck drivers who delivered the drugs, and the distributors in the United States who spread the poison into our communities. Being on threats emanating from the border, I have warned for some threat that foreign terrorists may seek to exploit our southwest border or some other port of entry to advance a plot against Americans. Just last month, for instance, the Bureau and our Joint Terrorism Task Forces worked with ICE in multiple cities across the country as several individuals with suspected international terrorist ties were arrested using ICE's immigration authorities. Leading up to those arrests, hundreds of FBI employees dedicated countless hours to understand the threat and identify additional individuals of concern. Now, the physical security of the border is, of course, not in the FBI's lane, but as the threat has escalated, we're working with our partners in law enforcement and the intelligence community to find and stop foreign terrorists who would harm Americans and our interests. As concerning as the known or suspected terrorists encountered at the border are, perhaps even more concerning, are those we do not yet know about because they provided fake documents or because we didn't have information connecting them to terrorism at the time they arrived in the United States. Staying ahead of today's threats demands that we work together. And for the FBI, that on our partnerships, especially with state and local law enforcement. Whether it's working through our hundreds of joint terrorism task forces, uh, to build out source networks, to identify those who slip through the cracks, or targeting the worst responsible for the violence that still plagues far too many communities through our safe forces, or taking the fight to the cartels responsible for trafficking the dangerous drugs like fentanyl pouring into our country, countless American lives. Staying ahead of the threat also means continuing to disrupt the cyber criminals ravaging businesses small and confronting nation states like China, targeting our innovation and our critical infrastructure. At the Bureau, we're proud to work side by side with our brothers and sisters in federal, state, and local law enforcement, our partners in the intelligence community, and others around the world for our commitment to keep Americans safe. Now, on Friday, the FBI will celebrate its 116th anniversary years of protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution. 116 years of working with our partners to safeguard the communities we serve. 116 years of innovating to stay ahead of the complex, evolving, and very real threats there. I am proud of the legacy the men and women of the FBI have built and all they have accomplished for the American people. So, if I may, as we approach this anniversary, I would just like to say to all those who are part of the FBI family, from our current employees to our formers and to our partners across law enforcement and the intelligence community, thank you. Thank you for dedicating your lives to this country and to its people. It is both humbling and an honor to serve alongside you, and I look forward to the work we're going to continue to do together. And with that, thank you again for having me, and I look forward to our <clears throat> Thank you, Director Ray. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule. The gentleman from uh, North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, I'm way down here, uh, and I appreciate the chairman giving me this because I've got to uh, 
the but let me ask this question why doesn't the f b i disclose to the american people all of the investigative detail and evidence that you are gathering as it is gathered well we have tried to be transparent with both congress and the american frankly unusually so for an ongoing investigation given the sheer nature of it we have provided a lot of information i expect to continue to provide information i provide some addition here today in response to your questions and your colleagues but part of the issue is that as like in any investigation as we proceed facts evolve our understanding of what somebody said turns out to have more context that we didn't have before we have additional so part of our goal is not just to respect the ongoing investigation process but also to make sure that we don't prematurely provide information that then two days later turns out to be different than what we told people because that's very much you know kind of a natural part of any investigation so did crooks fire eight shots we have recovered eight cartridges on the roof why was crooks allowed to get off eight shots well that thing we're still digging into again maybe this is a good place for the different investigations that are going on so because certainly I understand well and I am given that I've only minutes left and I know other members I'm really interested because I appreciate your invitation you said you're prepared to disclose things as questions are asked so I don't want to waste time sort of I just want to get to the questions that might and as many members as can ask questions that you'll answer I actually think you could be glad for you to go on soliloquy frankly and tell us what you know I think the American people want to know why was President Trump not kept off the stage we don't know the answer to that I want to be clear and this is important because I think it goes investigation the FBI's mandate is focused on the shooter and all things related to his attack now obviously I have very much interest and focus on the Secret Service's performance actions decision maker there are two separate after action reviews that the DHS inspector general and the outside independent panel has been convened that are focused on everybody understands it everybody understands it directly right here's the problem we're out 13 days and you say we've been disclosing you know we had the director or the colonel from the PS Pennsylvania State Police in front of Homeland yesterday he was quite candid he disclosed to us that Butler emergency services unit personnel were posted into the windows on the second floor of the AGR building that they left there to go pursue the person that they spotted crooks that they texted a photo of crooks to the P to the uh, uh, PSP representative in the command center that information was relayed to the United States Secret Service they asked that it be texted to someone else that was many minutes before President took, no, Trump took the stand what we don't know is why didn't he not why did he why were they not keeping him off the stand and to the extent you know that I know we always hear when there's a criminal investigation you got to wait for that to develop but the do you have any reason to are you do you have any other target of your criminal investigation other than crooks who's dead we are investigating the shooter both to determine his motive uh, and his preparations and activities before the shooting but also to make sure uh, whether or not there are any co-conspirators accomplices at this point have you developed any evidence to so suggest that there are any accomplices or, or cooperators or assisters not at this time but again okay. the investigations ongoing so here's the thing while we wait maybe for months and I hate to say this just I'm not trying to take a pot shot but we the country went for years you know, understanding that the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinformation as offered by respected former Intel officials and the whole time the FBI had the laptop and then let that happen in public until finally offering testimony in a case to the degree we wait to hear as a country and as a Congress what has happened in this event guys con conducting an investigation it provides quarter for the US Secret Service not perhaps to reckon with the problems that are obvious to everyone so let's get a couple in while I, I've got 13 more seconds one more question perhaps uh, Senator Grassley says that the records of the day show that there was a counter unmanned aerial surveillance operator on site was there and why did that person not crooks from being able to use a drone so again questions about the Secret Service's performance are those other reviews what I can tell you when it comes to drones is that crooks himself 
had a drone and i'm prepared to answer questions here today about the shooter and his use of the drone for example my time's expired gentleman yields back to ranking members recognized for five minutes thank you mr chairman <coughs> as i said in my opening statement political violence is a matter of the source or the target last october far-right conspiracy theorists broke into nancy pelosi's home and bludgeoned her husband prominent republicans mocked the attack and promoted conspiracy theories about it. Last August, an armed Utah man who threatened to kill President Biden was killed as FBI agents attempted to serve a warrant on him hours before President Biden landed in his state. Some on the right claimed that the man was simply a, quote, Second Amendment enthusiast. In recent weeks and months, those on the right have repeatedly called for, quote, civil war, with an Ohio state senator saying that if Republicans lose the election, quote, it's going to take a civil war to save the country, say. The president of the Heritage Foundation likewise said that, quote, we are in the process of the second American Revolution, which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be, close quote. <laughs> Director Ray, it's obviously important that we receive protection, but there is clearly a point at which some violent rhetoric crosses over into threats of violence or leads to actual violence. Could you describe how the FBI looks at this relationship between rhetoric and action and what you are seeing around the country? So I appreciate the question, and this is an issue that I've been talking about for some time. Uh, you know, in our, the right way and a wrong way under the First Amendment to express your views, no matter how passionate or even angry you are. And violence and threats of violence is not the right way. And we don't care what you're upset about or who you're upset when, from the FBI's perspective, when it turns to violence and threats of violence, that's when we have to draw the line. That's when we get engaged. Uh, and there is an alarming phenomenon that we've seen over the last several years uh, of that kind of passion and heated rhetoric turning into actual violence and threats of violence. We've seen it uh, against public officials of all sorts. We've seen it against law enforcement. The number of officers shot and killed in the line of duty in this country is frankly outrageous and alarming. Uh, and I know that because every time an officer is shot and killed anywhere in this country, since the day I started as FBI director, I personally call the chief or the sheriff to express my condolences uh, and to talk to them about the, the victim's family. Uh, and the number of those shootings that are related, meaning somebody is targeting law enforcement because they're law enforcement, is particularly alarming. I have made around 400 of those phone calls. It's almost every five days that a law enforcement officer is killed in the line of duty. And that is an example of the kind of ways in which uh, passion rhetoric can bubble over into violence. Thank you. Members of Congress, their families, and their staffs have been rising threats against them. I appreciate the work your agency has done to investigate and address these threats, but I'm concerned that we do not seem to be stemming the tide. What is the FBI doing to ensure that members of Congress, their families, and their staffs are safe? So we have a, a very close relationship uh, with the Capitol Police, um, and we have members of the, who are on some of our task forces. We share intelligence information uh, about things that we're seeing, trends that we're seeing with Capitol Police uh, and others in law enforcement. Obviously, if specific information about uh, an effort to target a member of Congress, then we're getting with Capitol Police in a much more specific way. Um, some of the things that we're doing. Thank you. Now, Director, your office is leading the investigation into the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. Republicans in Congress, including members of this committee, have repeatedly called for defunding the FBI. What impact would defunding or even just limiting your funding have on the FBI's ability to conduct this and other investigations? So I understand that there are heated views, opinions about us, just like there are about every institution, but our funding is incredibly short-sighted and the people it really hurts are state and local law enforcement and the American people we're all sworn to protect. Thank you. During my remaining time, I want to turn to a different matter. In recent days, Republican members of Congress have attacked presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris as a, quote, DEI, DEI candidate, which presumably is code for women and person of color. It's not a new theme for them. In May, Chairman Jordan wrote to you claiming that because of DEI initiatives, the FBI is no longer hiring, quote, the best and brightest candidates to fill the position of special agents. With remaining time, 
with my remaining time, Director Ray, can you please answer the following question? Is it true that hiring women and people of color means that FBI is no longer hiring the best and the brightest to serve as law enforcement officers? Is there any evidence that women and people of color are less effective in law enforcement roles? And what message does it send to prospective applicants when the leaders demean them and make judgments about them based solely on the race or gender? Witness may respond. So any notion that we have lowered our standards, our hiring standards, is just not accurate. Uh, in fact, the, our standards are as competitive and selective as ever. We have tens of thousands of people applying, and our selection rate is about 3.1%, which is more selective than just about any university in the country. Uh, and most of our applicants, I think something like 50 are coming from military or law enforcement backgrounds. About 50% of them also have advanced degrees. Uh, the average age is around 31, which means they're bringing a wealth of personal and professional experience when they arrive. And to suggest that those people, because of efforts related to diversity or anything like that, uh, are less qualified, frankly, is not at all consistent with what I see, having visited all of our field offices and seen these young people in action, and I think is an insult to those hardworking men and women who've signed up to dedicate their lives for this country. Thank you, Director, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Director, uh, let me go back to where Mr. Bishop was. Tell me about the drone. You, you, you act like you wanted to fill us in on that, fill us in. So uh, we have recovered a drone uh, that the shooter uh, appears to have used. Uh, it's been analyzed by the FBI lab. Uh, the drone was recovered uh, in his vehicle. So at the time of the shooting, the drone was in his vehicle uh, with the controller. Uh, in addition, our investigation has uncovered do you know what time of day he flew it, and if he flew it on the day of the shot? To, yeah. Oh, I'm so, sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. So in addition, it appears that around uh, 3.50 p.m., 4 o'clock in that window, uh, on the day of the shooting, uh, that the shooter was flying the drone around uh, the area. Uh, Two hours about, I'll be clear, but when I say the area, not over the, the stage and that part of, but I would say about 200 yards, give or take, away Okay. From that, we, we think, but we do not know, so again, this is one of these things that's qualified because of our ongoing review, that he was live streaming, you know, viewing the footage from that, again, about 11 minutes in around the 3.50, 4 o'clock p.m. range. Two hours before, he's flying a drone in the, in the vicinity of, of the yeah, route. About 200 yards away, yes. 200 yards, okay, that's, that's important information. What, what about the bombs that we've heard about in, in, the, in the shooter's car? <coughs> so again, uh, the FBI lab is exploiting those uh, explosive devices. Yep. There were, uh, we've recovered three devices, two uh, in his vehicle and one back in his residence. Um, are these are these what you would call your experts would call sophisticated operations, or this? When we, I mean, I think I mean I don't know. I, 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 that's what I've been told by yeah. people who have some understanding of this area. Yeah, I I, I think it's um, we've seen more sophisticated and less. I would say these are relatively again keyword relatively crude devices themselves, but they did have um, the ability to be detonated remotely, and so to that point. Uh, in addition to the two uh, devices that we recovered out of his vehicle, um, there were uh, receivers for those two explosive devices okay. with the devices and the himself uh, when he was killed by law enforcement, uh, he had a transmitter with him. Now, I do want to add one important point here is at the moment, it looks to us, again, ongoing review, and I right. can't say that right. too many times, at a moment, it looks like because of the uh, on-off position on the receivers, that, that if he had tried to detonate those devices from the roof, it would not have worked. Okay. Explosives weren't dangerous. And we're, I'm sure we're gonna get into all these subjects uh, a little bit later as well. Uh, tell, me, tell us what you can about the encrypted platforms we've heard about. So, um, one of the things that we're drilling into hard with the shooter to try to learn more about his state of mind, his motive, his ideology, his contacts, everything else, his devices, any uh, social media accounts right, he had, right. et cetera. And uh, one of the things we've learned in finally getting into his phone, which was also a significant technical challenge from an encryption perspective, but in addition, once we got on the phone, it turned out he was using 
some encrypted messaging application. And, and again, the same question uh, relative to the bombs, is this, was this pretty sophisticated or is this, this is the kind of the norm you see with folks like, you know, similar situation? How would yeah, you on this it? On this subject, I would say this has unfortunately now become very commonplace okay. and it's a real challenge for not just the FBI, but state and local law enforcement all over the state. Tell me exactly the scope of, uh, does the scope of your investigation include what I what I call that critical five minutes from when the, the 609, when this is based, I think, on the information you've given to Congress, 609 when the shooter's identified on the roof and 614 when President Trump is ultimately escorted off and all that happens, the shots that take place in between there. Do you have access to the communications that were going on at the time in that critical five minutes? So uh, our, our investigation, when you say scope, our investigation includes that time frame, although focused again on the shooter himself I understand. and his tech. The now, shooter's as involved part in of that, that, he's obviously involved in that time frame. Correct, and as part of that, as part of our focus, our investigation of the shooter and, and the attack, uh, of course we are interviewing law enforcement from the scene because those are some of the most significant witnesses and we're obviously getting access to their materials and that kind of thing and the Secret you're, you're Service getting has been access fully to cooperative. Any, you, you have access to the communications that exist there? That exact question, I don't, as I sit here at the moment, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I know that Secret Service well, has been cooperative with us. The Congress would like access to those communications as well. I mean, not just that five minutes, although I think that's the critical time frame. There's lots of communications we'd love to have access as well. I see my time is up and they have called votes on the floor. I think there are about six minutes left in votes. So we will, the committee will stand in recess until approximately 10 minutes after votes conclude on the House floor.